Oh, hey, welcome to Teams Tuesday. Uh, we'll start in a few minutes. Uh, we'll just let people joining. I know people are having their lunch for those folks um, in, on the East Coast of America. My, I'm the host, Peter Ward. OK, we've got a great guest here, um, Nitin from India, MVP. Um, with over 30 years of IT experience, I'm looking on his website and he has a Sinclair Spectrum computer from the early 80s. Um, so common teams, mistakes and worst practices. So Nitin, before we start, say dive into your presentation, um, how long have you been using SharePoint for? Oh, ever since it's there. What are we talking about, 2003 here or 2001? Uh, 2001, I think. Yeah. My word, this is before. Um, this was, this was, was actually called SharePoint? SPS, SPS it was called. SPS, yeah. STS. Okay. Oh, STS, that's, that sounds right, yes. Okay, and so you've seen it grow in each version and it's yes. now all, all into the cloud. Absolutely. Right, okay, very cool uh, on that. So um, for those who have just joined, um, you can put questions in the chat on the top right hand corner and I will facilitate the chat as well. So if you wanted to say a, a, a hi, um, you can do that. I've just said hi as a uh, as a chat question, which is published. So Nitin, you're actually in Mumbai, okay? So yeah. I'm assuming the lockdown is all quite heavy there, is it? Or, and the traffic is fantastic now. Yeah, so it's opening up. People are moving out. Official, it's still getting phased out, but things are becoming normal very quickly. Right. So you mean the traffic is, uh, it, uh, the in trains are packed, the buses are packed? No, trains are not yet fully packed, but uh, on the road, it's a lot of traffic. I see. All right. All right. All right. OK, very cool. Shops are open. Schools are not yet open. Otherwise, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. Very cool. So in t I noticed you've done a lot of speaking events. What was the last two countries you visited? Uh, Singapore and uh, Malaysia. OK, very cool. OK, and with all of the, um, the speakers and the presenters, I always ask them, like, tell us something which you which know about yourself that no one else knows. Uh, well, um, I do calligraphy as an amateur. That's my hobby. Oh, really? This is the, um, the, the handwriting, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Right, using OK, those special pens here. Hey, can you write Sanskrit? I can, yeah. All right, okay. Oh, okay, very cool. All right, so it's um, 12.17, so that's my introduction over. I've got a great um, 45 minutes with Nitin, uh, an MVP over 17 years, 30 years of IT, been using SharePoint uh, since the first edition in the early 2000s. So Nitin, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Peter. Pleasure. So, Great pleasure to address you, your team, and uh, your large audience we have. I'm going to go fairly quickly, and I welcome questions. As many as we can, we will handle them. In case we can't handle all questions, I will make sure you will get the replies later. Don't ask questions too early because most probably some of the questions will get addressed as I go along. Now, one fundamental principle which is a benchmark of everything we do. If you want to call something a technology, it should either improve something or it should give you a new capability which didn't exist in the absence of that technology. Just keep that in mind. Of course, whatever we do is user focused, but very often that gets sidetracked and other value subtracting distractions come into picture. I'm not going to talk about each one of them right now. As we go along, you will understand this. One uh, quick disclaimer. Most of the work I do is in Asia, so whatever I'm talking about is based on my experience with a lot of customers, but primarily in the Asia region. So some of the things may not be happening in your region. Just bear with me in that context. So Ricky, you can switch to full screen now. I'm going to stop the video so that you can focus on the presentation. So these are the broad categories in which I have divided different mistakes 
many of them may be familiar to you, but I'm just going to add some uh, specific comments on each of those topics. Because it's a very short session, we may not have time for demos, but let's go with it. Uh, at any point of time, Peter, you can interrupt me, ask questions or any changes you want me to do faster, slower. OK, um, oh, I will do. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right, so one of the common things from a user point of view when they go to Teams is too many notifications come. So the best practice is disable all first, understand what each notification does and never use banner plus email. That defeats the purpose. We are trying to run away from email, so don't have notification in email. It compounds the problem. If you have a choice, banner should be used very rarely. Email should never be used. Your best friend is activity feed. Now I'm assuming most of you are familiar with Teams, so I'm going to very specific things. This is not a generic Teams demo. Now another problem people come across is as you start using it, there are too many channels, too many chats. Again, becomes confusing. The answer is very simple. Pin the channels which are interesting to you and only pin the chat so that you can collapse the rest of it. Unfortunately, the fact that it can be pinned is not very visible in the UI, so you have to click on the three dots and pin. So that's simple confusion irritation. Now coming to counterproductive behavior. That means we are misusing Teams. One of the biggest problems there is misusing inbox. The purpose of Teams is to use Teams for teamwork, as the name suggests, but we don't realize that and we continue to use inbox. As we go along, you will understand which tool to use when, but primarily if you continue to use inbox in addition to Teams, we are not using Teams effectively. I'm not saying inbox is your enemy completely, but when it comes to teamwork, especially long term structured teamwork, inbox is your enemy. So his famous dialogue was why so serious or dialogue is why so inefficient. The next one is another very common mistake due to COVID. Everyone started using chat and meetings part of teams. But then when it comes to doing some kind of structured long term work, which we formally call project, we still end up creating a chat group and that's a bad idea. What people don't realize is Teams is not just chat and meetings. It has a dual personality. It is used for ad hoc work, which is what we got used to in COVID, but it is also equally good for structured work with long term objective. And that's another difference which people have to be taught the difference between chat and conversation. So if there is a conversation, people treat it like chat. People have to notice that there is a reply button for every thread in conversation, which does not exist in chat. That's why everything gets mixed up, and that is why we should not use it for structured work with long term objectives. Once that is clear, people start using it correctly. Another very common mistake is many people just deploy teams and don't educate people about OneDrive. In that case, what happens? Files which should ideally have gone to OneDrive end up in Teams, and then later on, it's difficult to manage the show. So discretionary knowledge has to be given to people as to where to store files, and many companies do a mistake of doing a phased approach, which says phase one Teams, phase two OneDrive. That's wrong. IT convenience should not decide phasing. What should decide phasing is all products to one group of people learn from it, then a larger group of people. Those kind of phases work best. So which tool to use when? This is an example of that category. Another common problem is trying to give custom permissions. Of course, you can go to open in SharePoint and do that, but you need to understand SharePoint security properly. If you don't understand it, you will end up confusing yourself and everyone else, and it's also a governance headache. So if you really need lots of custom permissions, probably you need another team with that context. The next one is errors of omission. That means there is something we don't notice it properly and then we make mistakes. One of that is synchronizing. OneDrive files get automatically synchronized whether you like it or not in most cases, but Teams file don't. And even if you want to synchronize Teams files, the commonest mistake which happens is in the files area there is a sync button. Don't click on it because that's going to sync only that subfolder, 
go to open in SharePoint. This is a good use case to click on that open in SharePoint. Go to one level up in the breadcrumb, click on documents and then say sync. Anyway, you don't have to worry about files occupying local drive because it's files on demand, but it gives you the facility of getting all the channel files in one click. The next one is pasting confidential content without realizing there is guess in top right corner. You always have a button, but many people have not been told to look at the button before pasting anything, so it's more of a user awareness issue. So if there are guests, be careful about what you're posting because it may leak out inadvertently. The next one we are talking about is. Loss of opportunity, that means there is a feature you need it. You have a need, there is a solution, but both of you didn't meet each other. That's inefficient. So one of that is which I have noticed is meeting recording being there. Many people don't know and even if they know they don't know that the transcript also gets generated and in order to make that transcript get generated, there is one manual effort involved. Once the transcript appears either in the meeting chat or channel, you have to go there. Someone has to go there and enable the correct language. There are five or six languages currently supported, but unless you have set a default, which most people don't, you have to set the language for the transcript to be ready. So make sure that happens. The other one is. There is planner and maybe people use planner on a channel by channel basis, but as a person I need to get a list of all my tasks across projects and that three dots stuff is not very visible or most people don't know. So remember three dots is important because that is what is going to expose you to additional relevant features. Same is the case with the. Plus sign in the channel tab. So notice those things so that you benefit from them. The other part is operational inefficiency where this happens all the time. I am invited as a guest speaker and as a guest, I am not a presenter and then people are randomly coming and muting non muting. I was recently many sessions I've done 1500 2000 users and I did not have the ability to mute all even if it's a meeting 250 people randomly and and the what compounds it further is people who arrange the meeting don't know, so everyone becomes a presenter and at the last moment it's impossible to suddenly make people attendees, so it's a bad idea. Similar thing from a security as well as operational point of view. It's important for people to know that the policy which is set for lobby can be overridden on a case by case basis by clicking on the meeting options and that is a part of user education because let's say you are inviting an important customer. You don't want their CEO to stay in the lobby, so you should exercise that. The next one is security and productivity. It's always clashing, but one of the biggest problems I have seen and I did a survey on LinkedIn of this around 30% customers said we can't create teams that defeats the purpose of teamwork. IT or whoever decided they should go through a process to create teams has three common problems or concerns. They are worried that too many teams will get created. Uh, teams will be created by people with names like MD, CEO, HR and internal phishing will happen or our SharePoint quota will get exhausted. All these three are not valid arguments. There is a governance associated with every one of them. I have written an article on that and I'm sure many of you know the solutions. So if anybody is blocking teams creation for these, please educate them. Another very common problem is blocking external sharing. This happens with SharePoint teams and OneDrive, so anything based on SharePoint platform. And this is a disaster because those security people who are saying external sharing is bad don't realize that for three decades we are sending attachments with no audit trail. Once you send an attachment, what security is there? Nothing, you have no clue. The fact that the file remains with you is better than any attachment you can think of, so educate them. The next one is mobile apps. Some people install only Teams app, not Planner and vice versa, something like that, so please give entire mobility to people only then they'll be really productive. Otherwise for everything I have to go to desktop defeats the purpose. The next one I want to go for is let's say lack of platform exploration and this is 
from two points of view. One is from IT point of view as well as from the adoption team point of view. One of the things which IT probably don't know is and as you're ready, there is a auto prefix and suffix. If you are worried about people use misusing some names like CEO HR, there can be auto prefix suffix based on department or whatever rules you have specified. So user created teams will automatically be visible as user created teams, which def which takes care of that concern. Another thing is too many teams proliferating is not a worry because group as you active directory groups have an automatic governance or recycling policy which you can set the duration for and people who are randomly creating teams and not using them they will automatically get purged if i am actually using a team of course the owner will get an email if they don't reply within a specified period then it will get purged and in case it happens by mistake of course it can be recovered within a specified time so no problem at all so these two common problems because of which IT or security guys stop users from creating teams are taken care of. The other part is teams became popular because of COVID and all that. That's fine, but many customers have many other components of Microsoft platform and those are not integrated because again it's the phased mentality. So everything in Microsoft platform integrates extremely well by design with teams. And if you are not using this, then you are increasing your manual work because somehow or the other you are trying to manage it. If you have third party products which don't integrate with teams because you may have purchased them before, it makes sense to now relook at Microsoft 365 because it's not just DLP versus DLP, it's pre integrated that minimizes your non productive work and focuses your attention on actual exception handling. So that's something we should explore and built into your platform deployment plan itself. Live events are again common, but there are a lot of problems with live events because many people treat them as say Facebook Live or YouTube Live or whatever people are used to OBS, Twitch. This is different. So you have to actually practice. Even people who are experienced in streaming get confused with Teams. It's not the greatest of interfaces, but with all the governance, all the auditing and all the integration. This is the best we have. Of course, there is scope for improvement, but if you have to do a live event, you have to practice it at least twice in a completely real life like manner. Otherwise you will fail. One of the commonest problems is there is one producer. If something happens to that producer, people are just helpless. So always have two producers on two different networks. Another common thing is lack of practice, which I talked about. Even if people do practice IT practices with IT that is useless. The actual present who is typically some external guest or top management, some boss, they have to practice because they are the weakest link. If they don't practice, everything falls flat because if it's CEO, there is no backup to a CEO during a live event. So please practice. The other thing is, and this is I have learned the hard way. If something goes wrong, and there is a communication gap somehow between the presenter and producer, you have to have a separate channel and that channel cannot be on the same network, not on the same PC as well. So I by default use either Telegram or WhatsApp group temporarily created with that customer so that in some, something goes wrong, we can actually chat and manage the show and somehow come out of the situation. Ideally, you should also have a backup presenter if possible. One more common problem is by default, when you create a live live event, the same event link becomes the video link and generally people start the event before and many times the producers are so happy that the event went on well that they forget to stop the event on time. So typically, that video which is available in the same link <laughs> as the original one has lots of unedited portions which can be not just irritating for the audience but it can be dangerous as well so please don't allow video link edit the video and then post the link that also gives you an opportunity to go to the audience again but minimize the delay if you send it one week later it defeats the purpose so you should have that process set the next one 
is adoption related mistakes. So let's go there. This all of us know many of you must be adoption specialists yourselves. So this is a very common thing. Everyone knows what is in it for me, but that is wrong. That does not lead to adoption. It's an overused term. What we have to tell people is what was in it for me. Unless you make users feel bad about their past by showing them how inefficient they have been, they should feel miserable about their past. Only then they will wake up and look at the product seriously. And I'm not saying this is the approach you apply for any change management, but when it comes to office, people are so inefficient. Now we are going through a pandemic. The problem is even if it's a pandemic, every living human being doesn't have the disease. Few million out of seven billion have. That's not the correct use of the word pan. Pan means all. So imagine if there is a disease which everyone has, which word will we use? We can't use the word pandemic because it's already misused. So that word is called normal. Why am I saying that? Because every person in the world who uses office is inefficient. It's statistically impossible to be efficient in a feature rich product because every activity can potentially be done in multiple different ways. The probability of you finding the optimal way every time by trial and error is near zero. You have to understand that you have to position that correctly and tell people in the right way. The worse they feel about their past, the more motivated they are about looking at the product seriously. So here is one example. If you ask people whatever they are in whichever context, are you using each of these components in day to day work? Everyone will generally say yes in a business context. So now you say, OK, if there is a particular business activity, does it cut across these gaps? So maybe I got a message on phone, then I went to file system, then I sent a mail, then I had to call for a meeting. We are jumping from one place to another. The business activity is still same. So that distracts you. That reduces your focus, concentration and quality of output. That is why Microsoft decided rather than you struggling with so many products, why not have one product which can do all that? And that is the purpose of teams. So if you position it correctly, then people wake up and take notice and then the chances of them not misusing it is much higher from day one rather than allowing them to do mistakes and then correcting it, which is much more difficult. Now you must be noticing in all this, there is something conspicuous by its absence. I'm not using any jargon whatsoever, and that is the biggest deterrent to adoption. If you use technical words, people just don't understand. You have to simplify it and put it not just simplified in English. Ideally, you have to put it in the business language which they understand. As IT or adoption person, you may have to learn that part, but that is absolutely worth it because it will increase your caliber in that context and that will give you an opportunity to use applied knowledge. Where to click, how to go, it's written in the manual. There are thousands of YouTube videos to tell you what to do. What is not there is when to use it, how to use it, plethora available, when to use it, zero. So you have to apply the knowledge. For example, you know, every channel can get an email address, which is a virtual email address. If you tell this to a user, they will puke. They don't understand what you said, but if you tell them if you are doing recruitment and you have multiple recruitment happening in one group mailbox, it gets confusing. Why don't you create separate channels for each open position and publish separate email ID? Then no confusion among the recruiter. That's called applied knowledge. A simple thing like immersive reader. Every chat message has an immersive reader option. Nobody uses it, but Teams is being heavily used in education. Kids love immersive reader, not just because it shows you nouns and adjectives. There is a picture dictionary there. If you have not tried it, try it out. It's amazing. Show it to your kid. They will want Teams tomorrow. So that's how you apply the context to whatever is the business or personal scenario. Another way of doing that is saying they create teams and add channels is not enough. You have to show different kinds of use cases. So here first is just a generic technical description. There's a little more evolved. This is 
one use case is completely different use case, completely different use case, and this is a use case to explain why you need a private channel. So when you illustrate correctly, then people understand it better and then they will use it on their own without troubling you much better. Another very, very big mistake is people just use Teams adoption. That's not enough. Yes, Teams is popular, necessary, but Teams is not sitting there alone. It's not a product created by some startup. Teams is a part of the platform. And if you do not position the platform correctly, people will misuse Teams and people will use the rest of the platform. So even if Teams may be your focus, you have to include the whole platform and that's the biggest adoption mistake. Even if you include the platform, platform doesn't just include OneDrive, Teams, Yammer, Todo Planner, Power BI. What about Word, Excel, PowerPoint? Every day, even today, people spend three to four hours on what? Not on OneDrive or SharePoint or Teams. They spend that on Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And all these products are designed to integrate with each other. If you don't show those integration points, you are asking for underused, misuse, and poor ROI. So bottom line is, first step is to show what is available, and second step, very important, is to show which tool to use when and why. And I'll give you an example of that. Normally, I show it with a build effect, but here, because you are a more evolved audience and we have less time, I am showing you this way. Ad hoc work, not urgent. That is the only purpose for which you should be using email today. If it is urgent, obviously you can't send emails, so use Teams chat. If it is urgent or not urgent, but it's a common goal with the team of people, then don't create a group chat, discuss it in a channel. If it's a task list, don't create it in Excel, put it in Planner. But if it is a personal task list, by all means, use Outlook task because that's brilliant. And either way, whether my task, flagged emails or Planner task, all of them are visible in a brilliant tool called To Do. That's why that app is necessary. And now it is getting integrated with Teams base UI itself. Now, if you don't have ad hoc work, if you don't have a common goal, but you have a large number of people and you want to interact with them, that is where Yammer is to be used. And finally, if you have a complex project with linked tasks, nobody all else gives it, then you have to use a formal project management software. So that is how you empower people by not forcing them to do something, giving them discretionary knowledge which they can intelligently use on their own. Next one is, this is a very common problem. I'm sure all of you have. If given a choice, I would like to become an expert in something, maybe one, two, three, whatever number of things. Of course, expertise and depth is important, but in today's world, one product cannot solve everything. There are so many products, so I have come to the conclusion that depth should be on demand. Breadth is more important than depth. Now, all of us may be understanding levels, level 100, level 200, like that content type. When I'm saying breadth is more important, I'm not just saying level 100. We have to have actually deep breadth. Focus on what is available, and then you will be able to understand how to put those ingredients together to create great recipes. If you go too deep into one or two products, of course you will be great at it, but you will miss out on what else is happening. So you may misuse a product when there was a much simpler way of doing that elsewhere, and that defeats the purpose. Finally, whatever you do, training content, posters, all that is good, but that just gives you a spike in launch. If you want long term benefit, you have to create standard operating procedures, which nobody does in the context of office, at least from what I've seen in Asia. <laughs> so you have to standardize because even if you do great training programs and all that, every user, we cannot teach every feature of every product. So if there is a business requirement, say this activity has to be done like this. People in finance or in manufacturing are used to SOPs. So we have never created SOPs for office tools, and that is why there is rampant inefficiency. So please standardize. Now the biggest problem is top management. They are just not interested, or they are too over smart, or they are too dumb, or whatever it might be, or all of the above. But 
look at it this way. If they are convinced they are the best advocates for everything you do, because if they get it into their brain that by doing this, I am not just doing something because IT bought some random product. I am paying thousands of inefficient people, and if those people become efficient, I am going to be more successful because as a boss, it's my job to grow business. And today it has become even more difficult to grow business because we have gone into negative and I have less people. I have more constraints. So the only thing which can help me is eliminate that inefficiency. And if that goes into their head in the correct way, then they will help you do this from a top down manner. And that's the best way of getting not just adoption, but something else which is completely missing. So obviously bosses are biggest enablers and why so? Because typically I don't know what is the percentage, but if you buy 1 million worth of software, what is the typical percentage of money you get for adoption? In Asia, at least it's a very small number. Ideally to do a good job and get good ROI, I think 30% is a good number you should go with. If you don't have that 30% money, don't spend that million because it's like putting it down the drain because anyway people are not going to use it because they don't know what to do with it. So if you want that 30%, the only person who can give it to you is not CIO. CIO doesn't have that budget. Bosses have the budget. That's another reason we should have bosses in your fold. So that's about it. And now let's take questions. So Nitin, what you're a lot of what you're saying here is almost like old wine in a new bottle in the same world as SharePoint. Yeah. Um, like in terms of like SharePoint sprawl um, with the team sites and team sites. Is this conversation ever going to come to an end? So uh, from my point of view, whether it is SharePoint or Teams, that question doesn't arise because as a user, I don't understand SharePoint, nor am I interested. I want to get my job done. So one of the uh, discussions which is very common from what I've seen is what happens to old file shares? In spite of SharePoint being there for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we still have file shares, at least in Asia. I don't know what happens there. Now those should not go to SharePoint. I feel they should go to Teams because already people are getting used to teams and it's simpler UI compared to SharePoint. Hardcore technical people can build applications on top of SharePoint. That's a different issue. But when it comes to collaboration and file sharing, expose teams first. If it can't happen, then go to SharePoint. Right. Um, I had a question in terms of someone wants to hear more about creating chat groups um, versus creating a channel. My understanding is chat groups is much more um, spontaneous, ad hoc. When you're creating a channel, it's a bit more longer term. Yeah. Um, if, any more comments on that or if you agree or disagree? Absolutely agree. What happens yeah. is it's easy to create a chat group and people go with the path of least resistance. The problem is chat is in, inherently designed to be short term in its nature and projects are inherently designed to be long term in its nature. So if you have a chat with same people, instead of creating a team with the same people, the problem is when a new person joins, they have to scroll some random chat, which is impossible. If there is a dispute about who said what, again in a long chat, it is difficult. The biggest problem is the same group of people may be a part of multiple projects, and then that chat group becomes a complete chaos. To segregate context, we create teams. All right. Um, in terms of uh, one of the slides you had, I didn't see the icon, the training uh, for st uh, stream because um, I have seen people use stream. Basically, now that people are recording stuff yeah. in stream, cutting yeah. it up and, and stream is actually you know, it's a fairly OK video editing tool and then they're putting and then they're adding it into teams. Yes, so stream is good for automatic minutes of meeting. That's the use case for end users. As soon as the meeting is over, the meeting recording is automatic. Unlike Skype, you don't have to re-render it using that link recording manager, which used to take an inordinate amount of time and <laughs> the recorder would still be on your local drive. Then you have to figure out how to share it and nobody did that anyway. So this is automatic, <laughs> but the fact is people can get automatic minutes of meeting. 
that phrase is never uttered in adoption programs. People would love it. Um, a few people are asking, is this session recorded? Yes, it is recorded. We'll generally break it down uh, bite sized a bit um, and we'll break it into the tips as well. If you, I, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see me post this over the next couple of days. Also, Microsoft um, is offering free training classes. So I've put a, put a link into this, uh, into the chat. If you fill out that form, we'll, we'll, we'll get you connected with your local Microsoft rep um, on that. Um, other question is, um, would be, in terms of um, a SharePoint intranet, now, as you know, in true Microsoft style, there's an overlap between SharePoint and Teams in yeah. collaboration. Can yeah. you see Teams replacing a company intranet? No. In no, not at all, because intranet, by the very nature of its thing, is a standalone component. It is not necessarily designed for teamwork per se. It is designed to be a portal. Teams is not designed to be a portal. Teams is designed for interaction, whereas intranet, at least majority of the components of intranet are read only for most users, whereas in teams, everything is read write for all team members. That's the primary difference. So interactive collaboration will best done in teams and centralized things which need to be available to everyone with centralized control and workflows and stuff like that is best done on SharePoint. So best of both worlds. Right. Um, I do find the complaint I hear a lot about Teams is that the search feature is not particularly great. Yes. Um, um, you know, that's probably in the road. In, in, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be in the roadmap. Um, it would be nice if that be integrated into Delve more as well. Yeah. Um, on that. Um, other thing as well, in terms of groups, OK, mm -hmm. am I correct? In terms of with a SharePoint, if I create a SharePoint library, I can add an AD group into yeah. that library. Yeah. With Teams, that's not available yet, is it? So originally what happened is Microsoft said, let's give people a choice. And that's what my reading is. I may be wrong. Uh, some people prefer to interact or collaborate based on a chat kind of thing. Some people prefer to do it in an email kind of thing. So they said, let's do something which does both. And that's how Outlook groups were for those kind of people and Teams was for chat kind of people. But the problem with groups and using them in Outlook itself is your bad habits don't die and you continue to misuse Outlook. So that's why now the focus, although behind the scenes, it's still Outlook groups and Exchange and AD groups. From a user point of view, Teams means don't use email for teamwork at least. So in that sense, functionally, it's preferred to do collaboration in Teams and ad hoc work, which is not urgent in Outlook. That's easier for users to understand as well, which one to use when. Yeah, it's very difficult to sort of get people out, particularly senior management, yeah. to get them out of Outlook um, on, onto this. So one related question is people go to Teams because either they, they are being forced or they are curious or whatever, but then if everyone is not equally participative, then someone posts something in Teams, nobody responds and then I have to send a mail. So one of the important things in adoption is to tell people how frequently you should check Teams. And the simplest answer is whenever you feel like going to inbox, which you don't need to be taught because that has become a spinal cord level reflex. Whenever you feel like going to inbox, just go to Teams first, then go to inbox. Over a couple of weeks, you will get used to it. Right, no, that's, that's true. I, th I actually find I check Teams more than my Outlook. Mm. Uh, partly because I've got the Teams installed on my phone, sure. and um, I, I, and I've actually, you know, basically, it's just a bit more, in you know, uh, instant and a bit more urgent on the Teams thing. Um, generally, when, when, you know, you almost know like everybody picks up their phone every like every six and a half minutes, or whatever it is, yep. and you, yeah. it's the Teams, Outlook, and WhatsApp, and then that's it, sure. <laughs> and then back to work. Yeah. <laughs> and on them. Um, the video and the audio in terms of like Teams use in terms of the roadmap, there Microsoft is pouring the money into like 
taking on Zoom quite a bit. So yeah. the complaint I hear with Teams, Zoom is connects much seamlessly. The complaint I hear about Zoom, about Teams is that there's a little bit more back and forth in terms of authentication, yeah. downloads. I, you know, I'm assuming Microsoft is working a bit, is working to smooth, smooth the process, reduce the yes. friction on this. Yeah, absolutely. So Teams is not as user friendly as Zoom is and now Google Meet or whatever. Agreed, absolutely. There is no two ways about it. The difference is if it's corporate data, you don't want to use something which doesn't have governance and compliance because you may say governance compliance is company's problem, not mine. But if some data leaks out and company goes into litigation, they are going to do an internal investigation as to who leaked that data. So you're also personally liable. So mm -hmm. for personal use, by all means, you use whatever is convenient. But when it comes to corporate work, that choice doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, yeah, two months ago, we actually had a, no, actually it was last month, we actually had a session on Global Relay, which is a third yeah. party tool for compliance, very popular with banks and finance. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, about how to integrate that into Teams. Um, and, and, and it's not that Teams uh, and Microsoft haven't got the compliance, but you want to be you, a compliant, you know, particularly if you're in a finance, you know, whatever you're using as a tool, you, it needs to be approved by the compliance and the security. And to, generally, if you've got Global Relay, it's a very nice wrapper around Teams. Right. I'm on that. OK, we've got four minutes left. There's a few so, more questions coming in. So, yeah, one, one request for all the attendees. I don't know how the feedback is getting captured, but if you can just give a one line feedback, that will help me improve my session. Right. OK, so can everybody do that in that one, one in that feedback? So Peter, uh, are there any questions which I have not addressed? OK, I will say this uh, teams in the groups. OK, hang on one second. Um, why can't we show GIFs and videos on Teams? Oh, well, by all means, by definite or default, they are available. Maybe the IT has blocked it. In fact, people are very sensitive about GIFs, and there is a central setting which shows the moderation level. So if you increase the moderation level, profanity or frivolous GIFs are automatically blocked. Another part of GIFs is GIFs are not stored anywhere, so there is no compliance issue. They are just shown live and that requires an internet connection. So it's not in that sense a security issue. OK, all right. For Jackson, any recommendations on Teams emails? I ran into issues with Teams emails looking similar to a security as a distribution email address. Yeah, so if you have enabled notifications as banner plus email in Teams, then you will get lots of mails and that's I would say a bad idea. But for whatever reason, if you have enabled it, I strongly suggest you create a rule and manage them because otherwise the volume becomes so great that managing your base inbox itself becomes irritating. And then you will inbox is something you can't go away from. You're married to it for decades. This Teams thing is a new relationship, so you will generally look down upon it. So don't enable email notifications unless there is no other way. OK, how to best use Teams for internal communication? That's a that's a I think that's an hour of response on that. But very quickly, what would you recommend? Yeah, so when I say internal communication, that sounds more like a generic thought. If it is a generic internal communication, do not use Teams, use Yammer or a similar tool, because if it's a broad based communication, Teams is not designed for that purpose. Right. OK. Please clarify the terms and functions of how is chat different than Teams? OK, uh, let me show you uh, the chronology so you understand better. When you are talking in a chat context, what happens is everything you type goes in the order in which it was responded to. Mm -hmm. OK, you're sharing your screen here. So yeah. So someone asked a question, someone answered it, then someone asked another question, then someone answered the first question, then someone answered second question, then someone is answering to the question of the second answer. It's all mixed up. 
Whereas here, even though people have responded at different points of time, the questions and answers don't get mixed up. And why is this important? Because chat, we don't scroll beyond two days, whereas a project may go on for six months and may have 20 people, 50 people in it. So we need to maintain the sanctity of what is called as a discussion thread. And if a new person joins, if they join in a chat context, they just don't know what is happening. Someone has to waste time explaining to them what has happened, and that person also may be confused. Here, they can just go through this and get up to speed very fast. Remember, if there are more than two answers, it automatically collapses. So it's much more manageable in the long run and in a structured way. OK, uh, OK, and probably final question. Um, so I think I may have asked this and then published this. It, it only goes as file shares rather than being displayed. They don't get so this might be related to the GIF question, I believe. I think so because GIF is not really a file. Probably file sharing on Teams. Everyone gets implicit read write access. You can override it, but then you'll need to understand SharePoint security and you will need to have the rights to change the SharePoint security, which is not generally available to everyone. Right. Understood. All right. OK, it's on the nose one o'clock. Um, yep. um, Nitin, thank you very much for your time. This is actually fantastic. Um, I know you, you've got a form here, which I will push out into the meetup group. If anyone has any questions, click on that form and um, fill that out and that will go and that will go to um, today's speaker, um, Nitin. So thank you for your time. I know it's a little late where you are in India, but um, we had a great session today of over 30 people. So um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure. Yeah. Okay. I'll see